Hello there, and welcome to this festive Tech Calendar 2021 session in which we're going to be looking at creating data visualizations using Synapse Analytics and serverless SQL pools. So a little bit about me. My name's Andy Cutler. I'm an independent business intelligence and data warehouse consultant. I blog a lot at datahigh.co.uk forward slash blog and also Synapse Analytics related content at serverlesssql.com. If you scan the QR code, that will take you to my Twitter account. I love a good conversation on data warehousing and especially Synapse Analytics. And I'm very, very happy to be presenting this session in association with Girls Who Code. So their website is at girlswhocode.com. There is a Just Giving page there for some fundraising for Girls Who Code. It's an absolutely great cause. If you scan the QR code, that will take you through to the Just Giving page itself. So we're going to be looking at creating an Azure Synapse Analytics workspace in our demo. We're then going to create a new serverless SQL pools database. Then we're going to cast structure over some data that's stored in our data lake. That data is stored as Parquet file format. We're then going to run some SQL queries to return data sets from that data that we've stored in the data lake. Then we're going to use Synapse Analytics Studio itself. So no other business intelligence tools. We're just going to use the Synapse Studio itself to create data visualizations. Now, what is serverless SQL pools? So essentially, we can connect from serverless SQL pools to data that's stored in external storage. So we can connect to Data Lake, Gen 1, Gen 2, Blob Storage, but we can also connect to Cosmos DB and data exported from the Dataverse. And we've got familiar SQL objects. We can create databases. We can have SQL logic encapsulated in stored procedures. We have system views. We can create views and external tables. And that's how we can cast structure over data that's stored externally. So with serverless SQL pools, we can read data from Azure Storage and Cosmos DB and the Dataverse. But we can also write data back to Azure Storage using a process called CTAS, create external table as select, which is purely using the serverless SQL pools engine. And ultimately, we can connect a client tool that issues SQL commands. So we can connect SQL Server Management Studio, Azure Data Studio, Power BI, Tableau. We can connect a variety of tools that issue SQL statements to serverless SQL pools. One of the things to consider is how serverless SQL pools is priced. And this is based on the amount of data processed. So it isn't any form of compute tier, any time to execute queries, it's the amount of data processed. So at the moment, it's roughly $5 per one terabyte of data processed. That means data that's been written and also read. And another important consideration is that there is no data stored within serverless SQL pools itself. It is a SQL based engine. There is no internal storage. So all the data is external to serverless SQL pools. So what would you use serverless for? Well, Microsoft themselves have three use cases of three distinct scenarios in which we can use serverless SQL pools. So number one is ad hoc data exploration or exploratory data analysis in which we can issue T-SQL commands and run queries against CSV data, delimited data, JSON data. So we have support for complex data types within JSON 
and we can extract schema information such as data types to understand that data but ultimately we can run ad hoc SQL queries over data stored externally. Number two is that logical data warehouse. We can create views, we can create external tables. So we can cast structure over data that comes from disparate sources. So imagine we have several external data sources and we would like to bring in that data and cast structure in a single database. We can do that. And lastly, data transformation, where we can use SQL, we can use the power of serverless SQL pools to do the processing for us, for example, aggregating large data sets into smaller data sets, and return that data set to the call-in application. A good use case is a tool like Power BI, connecting two serverless SQL pools, allowing serverless SQL pools to do the crunching and aggregating of those that large data set and returning to Power BI. We're going to go hands-on now with our demo in which we're going to create a new Synapse Analytics workspace. We're then going to create a new empty serverless SQL pools database and we'll configure that database to be able to connect to a Data Lake Gen 2 storage account with data inside. Then we're going to create structure over that data in the Data Lake by using views. And I have a dynamic view creation process. And then we're going to query and visualize that data that we've connected to in that Data Lake. So let's go hands on now. We're now going to create a brand new Synapse workspace in our Azure tenant. First thing I'm going to do is create a new resource group and we're going to call it the HRG Festive. Okay, we're going to create a managed resource group name. So this is a resource group where Synapse will provision some extra items that are required for, for logging. So we want to control what that uh, workspace is called. So we'll call it DHRG Festive Managed. Okay, now our workspace name, that's going to be the name of our Synapse workspace, a Synapse instance itself. So we'll say Synapse Festive. I'm going to keep it in North Europe. And I'm going to create a new data lake storage account. Okay, DH store festive. And a file system name, which will be a container. So I'll create a new one and I will call it festive container. I'm going to assign myself the storage blob data contributor role to the data lake storage account so that I can query data that's in that data lake. We go through to security. Now, I'll be removing this Synapse Analytics instance after, so we'll say, we'll enter a password. This is our SQL admin details. Let me confirm the password above. And I'll leave the managed identity. I'll leave that for now. I'll go to networking and I'm going to create this Synapse Analytics workspace outside of a managed VNet, outside of the scope of this session. I'm going to disable the ability to connect from all IP addresses. And I'm going to review and create that Synapse workspace. Now that our Synapse workspace has been created, I've logged into Synapse Analytics Studio and created a folder with several SQL scripts, which we'll use to create our serverless SQL pools database. So I'm going to open the setup script. I'm going to run a create database statement. It'll take a few seconds to run. And if I refresh, we can now see that database. 
I'm going to create an external data source which is a link to a container in an Azure Data Lake Gen 2 account where I have some existing data that I would like to query. I'll create a schema that I'm going to store my views in and I'll create a master key within the database and a database scoped credential which uses the user identity which is the Active Directory. So when I log in to Synapse Analytics Studio and issue a serverless SQL pools query, the Data Lake account that I'm connecting to has my credentials. And I'm going to add support for UTF-8. So once that's done, what I would normally do is manually create views which will connect to data in the Data Lake. But this time, I'm only going to manually create one view. And this one view actually holds some metadata in which I will use to create a series of views. So if I run this create view statement, I'm going to select from this view. And I have six views that I'd like to create. I have a customer view, a date view, I have my fact data, my telemetry data, and I have my product information here. And I've got some metadata which will be used to dynamically create the views. So if I expand data and I expand my SQL databases, we see we've got festive tech calendar, we'll expand views, and we just have the metadata view that we've created. So I'll go back into develop. So now I'm going to run a script which is going to create two stored procedures and these procedures will be used to dynamically create the views. I'm going to run these two stored procedures and in my trigger view creation I'm just going to execute these views, run this process and it'll take a few seconds to run. If we switch to the data tab, we can see the queries executed. We're going to refresh and we can see we have a series of views that have been created by this process. So now that our views have been created, I'm going to flip back to the develop tab and we're going to open the first of our queries. Now what we'll do is we're just going to do a simple select count and we'll get a return of the number of rows that we're dealing with. So 608,000. We're going to do a little top five just to show some of the data. Okay, so we have our user ID, our customer. We've got the event type. So a customer can either, or a user can either browse a product, put that product in their basket, and also purchase the product. We've got a product ID and a URL we have the device that the user was using at the time and the session view length in seconds. Now, when we want to start visualizing this data in Synapse Studio, if we run this select query and we'll aggregate by the event type, so put in basket, purchase products and browse products, we by default, we get a table back. Now that's fine, but if we'd like to compare that data, we can actually chart it within Synapse Analytics Studio itself. So I'm gonna go ahead and click Chart. Now by default, I have a line chart. I'd like to switch that and look at it from the perspective of a pie chart. I'm gonna select as my category, the event type, and my legend as the event count. And now I can visualize and see that browse product takes up a predominantly um, large amount of my sessions. I can change this to a pie chart. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run another SQL query where I'm going to select and I'm going to aggregate using the device. I'm going to do an event count. And again, I've got a line chart, but I'm going to change that to a column chart. 
I'm going to choose as my category device and my event count if I select that. Now as we can see we've got a pretty even split in our data across devices. Now if I'd like to see two metrics on one chart I'm going to aggregate by event type, I'm going to count the number of sessions and I'm going to aggregate the session view time as well. Now this does il illustrate one important point about charting with Synapse Studio is that we don't have any scaling or the ability to put one value on a second axis. So we've got to take that into consideration. So we're going to change our category column to our event type. And if we expand our chart out, we can hover over and see the values for each of our points. I can change that. And if I select a column, then I'll get two columns for each of my event types. And I can hover over and I can see my values. Now what I can also do is export this, but I'm going to export another graph later. Now, when it comes to showing two labels at the same time, we are slightly limited in what we can do. I have my event type and my device. I've ordered my by my device. Now, I can only pick one category column. So I'm going to pick device and I can see that my first three values are mobile, my next three values are PC, and my last three values are tablet. So if I change that to event type and change that to a column chart, I'm going to have three groupings of values. So this isn't a consideration when trying to chart multiple labels within Synapse Studio. Now when we're looking to join data together, it's going to open the join tab. We can join our views together. I have my dim date dimension that I would like to bring in some context from that dimension. We'll, we'll start by a simple select and aggregate by the date. By default we have our table. If I switch to chart, I'm going to expand our image. I'm going to select as date for the category column and we can see we've got our dates along the bottom and we've got our values here. Now I've got this legend position but I can change that and say I'd like that on the top left. I'd also like to change my series and say event count. And on my category label, event date. Now, if I'd like to export this, I can save as an image. I'm going to export as a PNG and open that PNG, and I have that image available. If we look at another query, where we're using some more context information from our date dimension. I'm going to select column as my visualization type and my category, I'll select my weekday. And I can see that Saturday and Sundays are the busiest times in terms of web telemetry with Monday and Wednesday being reasonably quiet. If I would like to switch that visualization I can change that to a bar where I'm now ordering from top to bottom. I can look at the top 10 products. So I will look at my bar chart, run that query in which we're aggregating based on the product name, but I'm only going to select one of the metrics. I'm going to select session view seconds. I'll select product name on the category and lastly I'll select column. 
so I can see which products are in my top 10. And the last thing, I'll select product category. So I'm going to select product category, run that query. And again, these are the views that we created in an earlier step. I'll select the column chart and I'll select product category as my category column. And now we can see that components has quite a lot in terms of session view seconds. Now I'm going to expand my queries again and click on moving averages because as we saw that event date chart, it wasn't particularly useful. It was very spiky, very up and down. We'd like to see some trends. So I'm going to run a trend where I'm going to be aggregating and calculating a moving average. I'm going to be calculating a seven day and a 14 day plus the event count itself. Now again, I'll just hide that window, expand my charting, and I have my three values. The first thing I'm going to do is change my category to event date. And I'm going to remove the actual event count figure. So I can select from my legend, my series columns, untick event count, and now I just have the moving averages. Okay. And again, I can do the same. I can show my session view seconds as a moving average. I'll take event dates by category. And now we've got the view session event on our chart. Now, if we can't show two very different scales, so an event count and a session view seconds, then we maybe can calculate and aggregate to a higher level the metric that we can't scale. So I'm going to run this query. And as we can see, I'll select my event date and we can hover over, but we can't really see much trending information because the moving average of the event count is a, such a low number compared to the seconds for the session event. So what we can do is we can just transform. And now we're going to transform that into minutes. Run that query. Change my category to the event date expand and as you can see we've got a chart that we can visualize all of our data at the same time and I'm going to save that as an image I'm going to download as a PNG if I open that image I can see I have this image here I'd like to thank you for watching this session we had a look at setting up Synapse Analytics logging into the studio, creating a serverless SQL pools database, and then querying and visualizing data that was stored in a data lake account. If you scan the QR code, that will take you through to the Girls Who Code Just Giving fundraiser. Fantastic cause. Thank you very much, and I really hope you enjoy the rest of the festive tech calendar 2021.